Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, as courted by all the angels, then he will take his seat on his throne of glory. All the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate men one from another, as the shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you whom my father has blessed, take for your heritage the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you made me welcome. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. In prison, and you came to see me. Then the virtuous will say to him in reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and make you welcome, naked and clothe you, sick or in prison and go to see you? And the king will answer, I tell you solemnly, insofar as he did this, to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. Next, he will say to those on his left hand, Go away from me with your curse upon you to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you never gave me food. I was thirsty, and you never gave me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you never made me welcome, naked, and you never clothed me, sick and in prison, and you never visited me. Then it will be their turn to ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, a stranger or naked, sick or in prison, and did not come to your help? Then he will answer, I tell you solemnly, insofar as you neglected to do this to one of the least of these, you neglected to do it to me. And they will go away to eternal punishment, and the virtuous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Yes or no? No, no. 
some didn't seem to be so sure. But is there any mention in there about saying your prayers every day? Yes or no? No. No. For our visitors, by the way, we have this dialogue here at St. Patrick's, so uh, feel free to answer the questions as you see fit. But everything seems to hinge on what we know as the spiritual and the corporal works of mercy. There are seven corporal works of mercy about the physical well-being that we need. And then seven spiritual works of mercy. While we're at it, let's see if we can list the seven corporal works of mercy amongst ourselves. Just put your hand up if you want to mention one, and then we'll see if we can get the whole seven. Yes. So feeding the hungry. Give shelter to those who don't have any. What else? Yes. Help the sick. Help the sick. So visit the sick. Yes. Visit the people in prison. When's the last time we visited someone in prison? We all know somebody in prison, by the way. We may not realize it. I got a reminder the other day. There's a friend of mine in there. Okay, I've got to make an effort to go visit them. They're a bit far away, but it was a reminder to me. Visiting the prison, those in prison. What else? It's a hot day. Gee, I feel like that. A drink, yep. Yeah. Feed the thirsty. What about when you're a crook? You'd like someone to visit you? Yeah, visit the sick. And there's one that's not mentioned here. What happened? This was very important for Jewish culture. And they didn't, well, the evangelists write about it when Jesus dies. It's burying the dead. Burying the dead. The last corporal work of mercy. And then the spiritual works of mercy are things like counsel the doubtful. You know, admonish those who are in error. Give wisdom to those in ignorance or knowledge to those in ignorance. Pray for the living and the dead. And so forth. So, it's on issues like the corporal works of mercy that Jesus will decide a lot of our final reward or final punishment. And there won't be a place to sit on the fence. But sometimes we like to sit on the fence, don't we? Yeah, I do too if I can, if I can find it because it's the comfortable position. Sometimes we don't want to take a position. But when Jesus comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead, there will not be a fence. It will be for me or against me. As simple as that. Now, of course, our Lord isn't saying ignore the Ten Commandments. Ignore prayer. He's not saying that at all. He's saying these are the very concrete, detailed actions that will be taken into account. Another thing that you might notice in the Gospel is that Jesus says, insofar as you neglected or you did it to, to the least of these of mine, brothers of mine, you did it to me. So I want to ask you another question. Who are the least of these brothers and sisters of Jesus? Any new hands? New hands? Who's going to be game? Who are they? Go ahead, down the back, please. Everybody. It's not just Catholics. It's not just Christians. It's not just believers in God. It's everybody. Everybody. Because there could be a total atheist who has need of us to reach out. And does Jesus want us to reach out if they're hungry or thirsty, naked? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Is there any exception to this? No. There are no exceptions. And I'm laboring the point because it's easy sometimes for us to excuse ourselves from having to do something because it's going to push us out of our comfort zones. Pushing us out of our comfort zones is the way in which we grow. We need to learn to be comfortable to live there. I know that sometimes we retreat back because we need to regain our energies. But yes, once we've done that, we go out again. Pope Francis puts it very eloquently. He says we need to go out from the centre to the peripheries and then come back into the centre. Because in the centre is where we are nourished around the Eucharistic community. 
is where we assemble together as the body of Christ. It is where we are inspired by the Word of God, where we experience healing and forgiveness, where we get a chance to express our deep desires through a song. We receive Jesus Christ in Holy Communion, as Mila will do in a few moments of time, for her first time. But when we are nourished, we are meant to then look outwards and reach out to the others in all their needs, wherever, insofar as we can help. Several years ago, I had the, it wasn't a, well, it was a privilege, but the sad duty of doing the funeral of a good friend of mine from school. And he had taken his own life. I won't mention his name because we're filming the homily. But it was very sad because he was one of my first friends, good friends, when I first came to Australia since I was eight years old. And to think that now I'm burying him before his time was a real kick in the guts for me. Now, years ago, 60, 70 years ago, 80 years ago, the church never gave Christian burial to someone who had taken his or her own life. Can anyone tell me why that was the case? Because it was a sin. And to take one's own life is objectively a sin. It is a sin, and a grave sin. To do ourselves harm like that, bodily harm, and that's the worst uh, expression of it. But why is the church now offering Christian burial to those who do take their own lives, and indeed for so many others? What's changed? Has the church has done a backflip. No, the logic is still the same. The reasoning before was that the person who takes their own life with full knowledge and consent, in fact, commits a grave sin. But with the dawn of modern psychology and the deeper insight into a person's inner state has led us to understand, led the church to understand that really, even though objectively something can seem very, very bad, God doesn't judge by the externals. God judges by the heart by what's going on on the inside at that moment. A well-known story in the time of St. John Vianney, who lived in uh, 1786 to 1859, 73 years of age, in the little town of Ars in France. And St. John Vianney, many, many people went to him, was a great saint, and his parish went from about 244 in the village when he first got there, and by the end of his life, after 40 years having been there, there were two trains daily from Paris coming to ours. One woman went bitterly distressed about her husband, who had taken his own life, jumping off a bridge. And he said, fear not about your husband. You made an act of contrition before he hit the water. He's saved. They might be in purification for some time. God had revealed that to John Vianney precisely to bring comfort to this grieving widow. Now, this friend of mine who took his own life had been wrestling with, with um, what do you call it? Horrible. Depression. Depression, thank you. A horrible illness because one's own ability to see the world clearly, who was going to Mass every Sunday, kept a lot to himself. And he wrestled with this illness for 25 years. And he even had the good sense. At that very night, it was a Sunday evening, I remember, and he went to the local hospital to check himself in because he was feeling very unstable. That's the action of someone who is fundamentally good, not bad. And then they gave him something to eat, checked him out, they, he seemed all right. And then they made a, fun, a fatal mistake. They left him alone. He'd eaten his sandwich and went off and did the deed. So, judgment belongs only to God. Judgment belongs only to God. And so many times we can think that we know what someone's going through on the inside. 
But I assure you, we only have a small idea if they shared it with us. We scarcely know what's going on inside our own hearts. Even though we think we have a good knowledge of ourselves. And for us to be judged or damned, rather, there needs to be three conditions. We need to die in the state of unrepentant mortal sin, which means a grave matter, full knowledge, and full consent. And this is why, in the confessional, the priest has a role of being judged. Not judging in the sense of condemning the heart of the person. It's fine. Isaiah is practicing for the choir. But the, not because of, of the priest is judging the heart, but rather to judge the degree of culpability, the degree of awareness that the penitent has. And many times a penitent has come in and said, X, Y, or Z. And I said, did you know that? Were you really doing it with full intention? Well, there's a bit there, but I wasn't. There's doubt. Therefore, it wasn't full intention. Therefore, it couldn't be what you're saying it is. The priest's role to help form the conscience in accordance with the church's teaching. When I was in Rome, one of my professors in fundamental theology was telling us, you know, one of the lectures in during it, conversation between classes, I went up to him and said, uh, so Professor, um, are you saying that uh, it's not possible for a person to be lost forever? I mean, this is clearly part of the church's teachings. And he said to me, which is something I'll never forget, he said, Mark, it is possible, certainly in theory, but we really kind of have to go out of our way to make sure that we are there. Because in practice, it's actually much more difficult. Because we're so fraught with weakness, with, with difficulties, with, with lack of clarity in our thinking. And just this awareness of the example I gave you about my friend is, is a, just a, a simple insight into the interior state. And that's why our Lord says to us, do not judge, lest you be judged yourselves. And by that, isn't that we won't experience the judgment of God at the end of our lives, we will. But that judgment will be merciful, merciful. And so, as we contemplate Christ coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead at the end of time, we don't know if this event will take place in our lifetime or sometime eons in the future. That's known only to God. But let us pray that God will find us ready. And that means we consciously seek to avoid grave sin. We seek to avoid all those things that are grave sin, and if we are aware of that on our conscience, to go to confession as soon as possible, and to avoid receiving Holy Communion while we're in that state. But to know the mercy of God is always way greater than our sins. Today is also a very apt day chosen by our bishop to launch his vision for parishes. Today, the bishop has put on the website and the materials will be forthcoming in the next few weeks so that parishes will be able to start unpacking this vision of his. And earlier this year, on the 18th of April, at our clergy and service, the bishop first shared his vision for us, what he sees in parish life. He sees, I, this is a little snippet, I see an intergenerational parish where, in the parish I see, where families are worshipping together in lively liturgies, where people are being prayed over, where the poor and the needy are given preference, where people are nourished in their faith and encouraged to go out and be missionary disciples. Of course, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the sort of thing he was saying. And then he's been working on it privately, so I'm counting the months, one, two, three, on the 10th of November, it's been nearly 10 months, and I said, well not 10 months, nearly 7 months, I said, Bishop, remember the vision you gave us uh, earlier amongst the priests, I said, how's that coming along, are you prepared, he says, Mark, I will give you some good news, on the 26th of November, Feast of Christ the King, it will be launched and published. And so, looking through it, 
one of the things that he said to us, the priest, was this vision is not about prescription. It's not about this and this and this I want to happen in each parish, but rather about giving you principles to work with. So I want to share with you these principles that the bishop has outlined in his vision for parishes. And we'll work on this throughout next year in smaller groups and in larger groups as well. He said the first principle is about encouraging people to come to Sunday Mass. And then he gave the three H's, he called them. One was hospitality, the next one was homilies, and the next one was hymns. And then he had two principles on community. One, that it's got to be a meaningful community, and that we should form small group communities within our parishes. And then he had two principles on discipleship. So the qualities necessary for active discipleship. And one was that we have clear expectations. Remember I talked about clear expectations a couple of weeks ago. That we grow, that we worship, or worship, that we grow, that we serve, that we connect, and that we give. And then another principle of discipleship, he said, about strength-based ministry. Then he talked about two final principles. One is about an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and then lastly, becoming invitational. Have you heard any of these before? Yeah, I know you can't see too many of the lists there that I often refer to, but they're essentially the principles of divine renovation. He doesn't call them that, but that's what they are. Focus on the weekend, hospitality, hymns, and homilies, the three H's. Meaningful community, small groups, clear expectations, giving strength-based ministry for discipleship, an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and becoming invitational. So I want to finish with reading out to you his short letter for the launching of this, this vision of his, and that it's particularly apt for us as we look forward to Christ coming in glory, all our preparation. All our work as disciples is always to prepare for the coming of the kingdom, which is what we fundamentally pray for every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. I need my glasses for this, I'm sorry. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on the blessed solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe, I wish to give you the vision for parishes in the Diocese of Wollongong that I have been prayerfully discerning over the past 12 months. It is almost six years since I was ordained the Bishop of Wollongong, and as we approach the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the Diocese, I believe now is the time to pause and reflect on the life, health, and direction of our parishes. Our parishes are far more than lifeless buildings or mere meeting places. It is our parishes, in our parishes, sorry, that we gather together to celebrate, hear the good news of Jesus, and live our calling to love as God loves, with good works and care for one another. The beating heart of the parish is the person of Jesus, made present in word, sacrament, and the living community of believers. This heart, beat, this heart beats with the words, come and see, and go and make. Come and sing, and come to the person of Jesus. Be transformed and renewed, and become disciples. Go and make. Share the joyous good news with a world that does not know or has forgotten Christ. Our Lord Jesus is King, not by violence, force or coercion, but by an invitation of love, mercy and grace. It is no secret that there has been a decline.
decline in Catholic practice in our parish communities over recent decades. Some may argue that this is clear evidence that the world has left our model of community and the Catholic faith behind. But thankfully, this is not the case. Pope Francis boldly proclaims, quote, The parish is not an outdated institution. Precisely because it possesses great flexibility, it can assume quite different contours depending on the openness and missionary creativity of the pastor and the community. Unquote. From Evangelii Gaudium, which is his letter on the joy of the gospel, now ten years old. We must practice the flexibility that our parish communities possess, calling on the Holy Spirit to challenge us in our openness and to draw forth missionary creativity, not just for our own sake, but for the sake of the world that needs us. To this end, you will be receiving the following documents today. Come and see, go and make a vision for parishes. The vision I have developed, which I now invite you to prayerfully read. Next, principles and foundations. A short explanation of key principles described in the vision document. Thirdly, go deeper. A short compendium of additional reading on key concepts discussed in the vision document. Additionally, in December, you will, your parish will receive several worksheet documents that will support communities in the process of prayer, reflection, and discernment in the new year. Your engagement with these activities will be a crucial part of the renewal process in your community. We embark on this journey together trusting in the goodness and mercy of God who promises, quote, I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope, unquote, from the prophet Jeremiah chapter 29. I encourage you to pray for your communities and your pastors, and please pray for me as we follow the Good Shepherd to where he leads us. Let us make this our prayer from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Learn, lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. With every blessing, most Reverend Brian Mescal, Bishop of the World. Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come in all its justice, a kingdom of goodness and truth, of holiness and grace, a kingdom of justice, love.